All right, thank you. Well, hello, everyone. I'm glad to be here again. And um, thank you for the opportunity that I can share some of the uh, things I learned uh, from Anand in, uh, in my career with you. He's actually uh, my favorite world champion. Uh, I wouldn't say he's the strongest, but he's my favorite. I have learned from Anand's games more than any other champion. Okay, maybe not my favorite in terms that I like Kapolanka a lot, but I learned most from Anand. And in my book with Sabina Sherlock's method, the one we published recently, uh, I have more examples of Anand's game than my, my, my games. That I think tells you enough how much I looked at Anand's games and how much I learned from his games. Um, in an interview, I think it was 2015, or I'm not sure which year is that in the London Classics, they asked players to, to talk about uh, each other. And when it came to Anand and the other players were talking about him, they dubbed and they used terms as uh, ageless, legend, uh, genius, things like this. Difficult opponent, of course. Uh, so um, now I want to ask some questions. Maybe we start with this with this kind of conversation. That uh, what are the things we can learn from Anand? So I always going to look. Okay, I can show you some games. I will show you some games. There are hundreds of games. That, of Anand out there that you can learn from. There are some games that is not so, I mean, you can learn from every game, but there are some that is, in terms of educational value, they're not as high as the other ones. So let's say he has like 500 games that you can learn from. You can, I pick some, I picked the famous ones for this class. But the question is that, what is it that we can learn from by looking at Anand's game in general? So I've made a list of six things, but uh, I would love to see people's opinion. They can. How, do, how does that work, Kostya? We, uh, we ask them to write to, in the chat or uh, they just unmute them? Yeah, they, they can write it in the chat or something yeah, like that. Chat, yeah. yeah, if it's a general thoughts, open chat. If it's like, you know, calculation, then private chat. So they don't okay. share their answers. Yeah. Okay, sure. So tell me what you guys can learn from you know, the things that you can learn from. <laughs> One would like to share the, their opinion. I see people talking about snow. We are not we're talking about Anand, not snow. <laughs> I have some ideas what we can learn from Anand. How to capture like a beast. Well, I think every world champion, every top player, top 10 player, calculates like a beast. But yes, I mean, Anand also, especially when he was at his best, could calculate very sharp and fast. But that you can learn from any world champion, basically. Any, any contemporary top player in the past 30 years, since 1990, 31 years now, you can learn that. But more specifically, um, okay, um, okay, I think no one is the right thing, anything. Nobody said anything. Okay, I'm going to uh, read through my list. I, I, want, I want to give it a chance for everyone. I think Anand is the master of preparation. I don't think anyone in the chess history of the, I mean, one of the world champions had the kind of prep Anand used to, used to do, even Magnus. I mean, now maybe, maybe Fabiano is there now. I mean, but he has, he has means that Anand earlier at his career didn't have, and still he had very deep preparations, deep in terms of the ideas and the, and what's going behind the, each opening prep. So Matt, Anand is a great master of preparation. Uh, for, for a long time, when I, when I prepared some opening, uh, the first person I go to, my go-to person was Anand. For a long, long time. Um, uh, also, also, the second thing you can learn from is the versatility. Anand has split almost about every single opening I can imagine with black, except maybe King's Indian. I can I can say Anand has split every single opening with, with black against d4, e4, c4, anything. Very, very versatile. So you can learn how to. Uh, someone's asking. Kid, uh, I have to ask this one from Kostya. Have you seen a game of Anand with Black uh, playing Kid? I've seen him playing against Kid, but... I mean, I'm sure he'd be a beast, but I can't think of any games with the Kid. Mainly yeah, I don't Grunfeld. think he played with that. Yeah. In, in Kings in the Indians? Yes. Okay. Kings in the Indians, yes. Um, so... Well, I know he played he played numerous games in, in Grunfeld, of course, but... Uh, Someone's checking. Anyways, but he very versatile. Yeah, another thing. This one I learned from. Uh, this one I learned from uh, Kasim Janov. Night moves. He's very good with with, with night maneuvers. 
uh, effortless, effortless, effortless defensive skill, creativity, and uh, he's a walking encyclopedia. He, uh, in 17, Sabina was grandmaster and resident at St. Louis Chess Club. He was playing at the Cup. On the way out, we asked him to sign the, uh, the board, and he congratulated Sabina on, on her win with the Queen's Sacrifice in the last round of the US Championship. And I was like, what? I mean, he had seen that game. So you can just see how he knew everything about every single player. He knows everyone, knows their games. That's that's something big. I mean, learning more is never there's not there's no end to learning things. That's what you learn from another. So these are the things I've, I've had in my list. This is game one, and this shows as 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 early as 1989, he was a master of preparation. So let's go through the game. This is a game between uh, Anand and Joel Benjamin at uh, Waikanze. Now it's called Tantar Still, and a few days ago, or maybe just a day ago. It was won by um, uh, Jordan Van Forest. So, Richter Rouser. Six, Queen D2, Bishop E7. Nowadays, this is the uh, preferred setup. If you're playing this opening, just didn't want to mention, and then, and then play Bishop E7. They want to go either B5 and... Uh, although, um, engines kind of apparently hold, so this is not that bad. Bishop e7. It's not like a question mark, just apparently not that accurate. But Bishop e7 castles, castles, and knight d3. Um, f4 was one of the lines here, and uh, after knight takes d4, queen a5, I think they stopped playing this because of this e5. This ending is very uh, uncomfortable. I think that's the reason it's out of the fashion now. So, knight b3. Queen b6, developing. Um, what is Black's plan here? If anybody would like to tell me very quickly, and you don't have to unmute because this is just a qu quick question. What is Black's plan here after Queen b6? Probably a5, a4. Not a5, a4, no. a5, he goes a4, no, 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 not a5, a4. <laughs> I muted in Zoom, he didn't hear Wow. Me. <laughs> Someone else suggested at the exact same time. <laughs> we don't think he has changed, you know? Yes, rook d8 and uh, d5. That's the plan. So I have three, rook d8, and this was a popular line in late 80s and early 90s. And here, here, uh, uh, Anand comes up with this very interesting, at the time, novelty and seeming, seem, seemingly meaning, meaningless move. He plays king d1, lets him to play d5. So, uh, and he plays... and. Joel plays d5, which played d5, and he played bishop f6, bishop f6, ah, I didn't, he had to play bishop f6, and he goes d4, why this is a bad move? Can anybody tell me? Okay, time to calculate. I fell for this trap once shortly after this game. It's like in... Like in 1990s some, sometimes? Uh, yeah, 1992 or something, 93. I think I know this game, actually. Hit me with this trap. Yeah, and this, this is very know. funny, King V1. And, what and this, what's that? Yeah, I just didn't know. Didn't uh, yeah, know. And if you don't know, just... I fell for it too, but in a Bliss game, so I was lucky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is a sick trap. Wasn't it way. like over the board game, this one? Mm-hmm. I mean, I was, I was a younger player. <laughs> I was very young. Still young. I was maybe 2100 at the time. Uh-huh. Wow, you were at the beginning. For you. So, uh, the idea is that, guys, I don't see any answer. Yeah, let's give them another minute or two. They should try to figure out. Yeah, this one, this one they should be able to figure out, yeah. Why is this good for white after rook takes queen? It's it's white to move. That's the that's the thing. It's white to move. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I'm. No, I mean no. I'm just telling who are asking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You were reading the question. I see. I'm just ask. I'm answering those who asked the yeah. question after rook takes. It's white to move. So if uh, what does white do? So that if, even if he lets the rook takes queen, even if he does, I mean one option is to move the queen. Then. 
I was asked if I showed you somewhere. Yes, I did, but this is about Anand and this marriage. I showed it in a different class for some other reason. So it's white to play. Why just took on f6? Okay. Why click on e4? Uh, should I get an answer? No, no, no. So the answer is bishop takes e7. Rook takes d2, and now I go knight takes d2, exclaim. Because knight can take on knight takes e7, I go knight c4, the queen needs to cover this square d8, right? So I took queen c7, and then there's knight d5. The king has moved from c1, that's why there's no queen f4 check here. That's why he played the move king d1, and so that he could play bishop takes f6. Very strong prophylactic move. Uh, in, an, in, an, in, a, in an annotation I read many years ago from Anand, I'm talking maybe it's from a 90 annotation. He said that he found this improvement over a game of his against Agdishtan or something like that, or Agdishtan's game against someone else. And that's how he, he came up with this. Uh, so the game continued. Uh, don't right. want to spend so much time on it. You'll just to show how Anand was prepared as early as 1989, just the beginning of his career. He just He's just become. A GM, maybe he had won the World Junior, just won the World Junior. Um, D takes E4, and then, yes, he had his prep, but later on the game continued, and it, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, quality of the uh, game wasn't there. There were so many bl uh, blunders back and forth. Benjamin was even winning at some point, but anyways, uh, I'm not end up winning the game. Okay, now let's get... Let's get moving forward to look at uh, Anand's games against the top players. He, he His main rivals all these years. Uh, of course, Carlsen should be mentioned, but I don't think we'll have time uh, for Carlsen. But Kasparov, Karpov, and Kramnik. So you cannot talk about... Oh, let me just save this. Something wrong with my mouse. Now, this is a game... Then this. Uh, Kaspar, uh, uh, oh, this is Anand's pro. Oh, I have to go back one game. Ah, oh, Kasparov Anand, first this game. Uh, this is uh, this is Anand's first win against Kasparov, and this is the first major tournament Anand won. And winning this game against Kasparov was important because he ended up with six out of nine ahead of Kasparov. And the first victory in a, in a top notch super tournament is very important. Uh, if you look uh, for Krasnov's career, for Kasparov's, for anyone. And this was for Anand. So e4, e6. It was Anand's opening at the time. He used to play French, but he also played so many other openings there. Then I think he was playing Petrov, uh, Russian defense, and he used to play also some um, um, some Sicilian. He, he was also playing Richter too. Ninety two. C5, and funny thing, if you look at the uh, the recent games of the GM games in 92, you'll see much less knight f6, a lot of c5. And the fact that Anand always plays c5 over the move knight f6 shows that how early in development of this opening, this is Tarosh uh, in, in, in French, he knew that c5 is a better choice. And now today we know for sure that c5 is the, is the right move. Right. Well, that's the right move. Is the better move, right move, not not the right, not the correct uh, choice of word. C5, E5, Queen D5, B5, Knight Bishop C5, Knight F3, Knight F6, Bishop D3, Castle, Queen E2, Knight B7, Knight E4. So I ran the engine here on div 40, and I wanted to see. Okay, I didn't expect it to be very accurate this game because this is from 1992, and I have a. Uh, newest version update of Stockfish, which uses some uh, LIDA evaluation in it. And I have a re relatively good computer for my level. And uh, I let it run to depth 40, and then I went back and forth. Here on Anand's prep, which was a novelty at the time, is the best move of the engine. Isn't that just, I was just, wow. Just <laughs> 1992. Wow. The, 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 the opening accuracy is as good as depth 40 of the engine today. So 
this was this was uh, this is big, and he played b6. And after knight c5, this is also good move. surprising. He doesn't take with a knight; he takes with a queen because he, he has to keep controlling e5 square. So after bishop e3, queen c7, bishop d4, bishop b7, long castle. What would be your evaluation of this? I don't know. Uh, should we discuss it among ourselves or uh, just Greg and I? I, I, I? At first, when I look at this, it looks like it's really bad, right? For for black. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. It looks really. It looks no. Of course, yeah. It looks really bad. Just at first glance, yeah. Dark squares. Yeah, I mean, it's very hard. Ninety-five G four is coming. Look at G one. Looks very scary. Mm -hmm. The engine says zero, and this and Anand entered this relatively fast. Maybe that he had some prep, expecting this happening. So the depth of understanding that he realized this is actually okay is very uh, unique in a sense. I mean, <laughs> they didn't have engines at the time, right? Yeah. <laughs> so entering this and knowing that after this move, knight c5. He completely equalizes is quite quite something. Wow. Because bishop there's no bishop of six guys, right? Bishop of six runs into Queen of Fort Check. So and now uh, he played bishop e5 in the game. Knight takes d3 check, rook takes d3. I think Kasparov should have started bailing out with this move. And then after queen to c6, queen c5 is bad because of bishop e6, of course. Queen c6, bishop of six, the game is kind of complex. I still would, would not feel so comfortable playing this as black, but after queen c5, engine was very calm. But engines are most of the time calm these days, aren't they? So, um, rook d3. Now I want to ask everyone, how can, why is he still trying to get initiative? And we're talking Kasparov playing with white pieces, and he was always very aggressive playing as white pieces. How in an unbalanced position, and uh, makes a move that creates some winning chances for him as he's also trying to equalize. Because a lot of time when you prep these days and just give you a cutthroat way to dry the position and make 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 a draw with black. Good. But sometimes you know you already know that your opponent are not making good moves. And uh, maybe you can start playing for initiative. But we don't know, and we, we kind of start looking at engines move and they're kind of like oh zero zero zero, doesn't matter. But some of the zero zero ones are better than the other ones because they can pose trouble. And somebody always said it, queen c4, attacking a2. I'm running into some sort of a tactic here because knight d4 of g3 is a thing. I can sacrifice the pawn on a2, um, but it works. And I still need bishop of six because of queen f4 check. So he played knight d4 in the game. Uh, king b1 was, was not a good move because there's bishop b4, but I think uh, bishop f6 this queen e3 take a 95 was what I analyzed with the engine. I thought that I would have done this, but I mean, who am I to say what this power should do? Um, 95, and then yeah, you go rook hd1, b7 is weak, f4, g3. Uh, but okay, what black is also in time to play rook f8, h6, or h5, uh, like this. Why are Oops. Also, you have to realize this is really weak. So, knight d4. You should, okay, uh, it's very funny. In all analysis, they said queen a2 and the position is is playable. I don't mean to, to laugh at those analysis, but just this position was considered unclear. But after knight, uh, after check there and knight b3, actually, this has been winning for what? Because rook b3 is coming and my queen is not doing anything yet. Okay, knight b3 not that easy to find. It's surprising that they have looked at it until queen g4, but they didn't see that knight b3 just gives a winning attack to black. So, but I later on found some analysis of, of Anand, and guess what? He had seen it. So, queen c4, uh, knight e4, bishop e4, uh, uh, rook to e3. Here, uh, Kasparov had to really bail out now. This takes takes knight e8, rook e1, and uh, black has either bishop back to c6, f6, or f6 right away, and the position is balanced in the end game. But that doesn't mean it's, it's a draw. 
it's it's a game i mean either, either side can outplay especially here with the opposite color bishops here uh suddenly if you get a better structure and you control important key scores with your knight all of a sudden one side runs out of good counter play so this is a very tricky position can swing either way so um rook e3 now what do we do let me ask everyone and this requires some calculation it's not just one more okay any any opinion it's time for action right nothing yeah but what if i take on f6 so what, what are they sending you with line queen you... a2 they do ah right they did in the direct message they said queen a2 but what about bishop takes f6 yeah, yeah we can't queen see the message is sent to you yes 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 I, okay. I didn't realize it was a direct message because i see all of them in the same uh yeah 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 <laughs> i didn't realize that one was directly for me yeah so uh queen takes a2 we should take f6 then what Somebody says rook c8. Rook c8 is a blunder, right? I mean, I'm afraid that this this runs into uh, some trade and then take on f6 and e4 is hanging. We went queen c4 for a2. We really should think of queen a2, but what's happening after bishop takes f6? Looks like we are losing a piece there. Rook takes e2. Also, you have to be careful about f6 again. Uh, somebody wrote me about rook, rook c8 or first take into rook, rook c8 we, we, we cannot do that because the bishop on e4 is loose so since okay Daniel, you got it right yes queen takes a2 bishop f6 and bishop g6 beautiful i love this wow so kaspar play rook a3 queen back d5 uh, bishop e5 of course f6 and then the end game is just i mean not end game the position is just i would <laughs> i recoup the material the, the piece i'll be up a pawn and my bishop is beautifully attacking c2 soon enough i'll target i'll target so many weak squares and wise wise king will collapse wise king castle will collapse and the three i mean this is this is he could play like play like this but uh, it looks bad Although engines could have hold, but doesn't matter. Practically, this is really bad. So, h4 was played by Kasparov, takes h5, and uh, on enters this position. He was really ahead of his time because entering this position against Kasparov, it requires a lot of psychological preparation and as well as uh, <laughs> accepting that we will actually be better here. I mean, yes, you're up two pawns, but look at that. The entire h file is open against my king, right? F five is the only move, yeah. and now rook h four. Now this is the this is the funny part. This is where Anand makes the second best move, which is not losing, which is a good good move still, but not the winning move. But the winning move is kind of like really really impossible to to play. So I'm just going to show you because I want to show more games. So the move is queen uh, c five, which is really odd because the only thing it does is control e three square. And preparing rook c8 in case the queen leaves, or like queen f3, I have rook c8 with a tempo. Um, but after queen d2, I was analyzing king g7, and then I put my king to f6. <laughs> and the pawns are kind of covering it. Okay. So queen f4, d5, the chase doesn't get anywhere. And then, and then this is the plan. Uh -huh. So, and the king will be safe. But uh, Anand played f4, which is still good. I mean, he's a slightly better slot to that because any other move is bad. Queen f3. I think he, he could play better than this. But And then he had to go queen h3 to, to maintain his initiative. But he played rook f4, and then after this, queen c4. A very important tempo. c3 and king g7. Another, another accuracy. Again, talking about a formless defensive uh, moves, you see how easily after f4. He found this move, rook c8 best move, uh, rook f4, queen c5 best move, tempo, and then king g7, immediately. Preparing. If he goes rook h4 back, he can play rook h8. He played that move. 
queen e5, g3, queen e1 check. We see d8 also have the check on d2 there. Queen e5 back, gradually improving his position. Queen back to c7, defending, and he wants to trade next. e5, forcing it. And now he's off a pawn. And look at this, just gradually, I mean, now improving, pushing the pawns. Covering d2 square, a5, queen e2, and uh, queen e6. Yeah, and gradually just converted this into a full, full pawn. With, with absolute accuracy. Being sharp, entering the positions that wow. looks dangerous, that looks dangerous, but really it was just off of material. Uh, very much ahead of his time, and very... Uh, very interesting. This case, this game, in my opinion, demonstrates his demonstrates Anand's skill from early stage in his uh, career. That how his defensive skills, how how good he was at it. All right, next game. Yeah, that was against Gary, guys. Gary Kasparov, 1992. Should I skip? Given the time, should I skip and go to Tarpo, or should, yeah. I, should the next game with Kasparov too? Um, whatever you think. Okay. Every game you like the best. All right. So I'll go a little bit faster. This one because I, I want to mention here a little bit about Anand's career. So, who knows when was the first time Anand played in the candidate? Who can tell me that? Because the next game is important in that respect. 1994. That was 1997. That's a long time ago, right? Now, 1987. Now, that's that's too early. That it was not even 20 at the time. 91. Somebody Google it probably. Yes, 91, 92. That was the first time he lost to Karpov in the quarterfinal. In a very close match. Uh, so, uh, in 95, he got to the final of the uh, PCA World Championship to play against Kasparov. And the start was pretty good. After eight draws, oh, yeah. After eight draws, he won this game, and the only game he won against Kasparov. And uh, I use his own analysis here, some to, to show you. And this is a very important game. Shows that how Anand could out prepare Kasparov. Well, what happened is that after losing three games in a row after this, Anand had uh, Anand struggled all the way till end of his uh, until end of Kasparov's career as a, as a professional player to play against Kasparov, and he never beat him in a, in a classical game ever ever since. I think the experience was was too much of an effect on on, on Anand. So for a long time, even if he would win a tournament, he won Linares, he would still keep losing to Kasparov. And that little bit put some, uh, it put some halt on his uh, progress to reaching the World Championship final and for, to, so some, for some time. Maybe that's why he became World Champion immediately after, after Kasparov retired. So Kasparov plays his favorite E6, Shiveningen. Why Kasparov like this opening, guys? You can tell me. Nobody wants to tell me? He won the game 24 he, of his match yeah, in 1985 against, against Karpov when he became world champion with this opening. So, showing it was Kasparov's to go opening. It should be 3. A4 is, of course, to stop B5. And then I will go fast to... Like King H1, and this is a very, very well known system. Anand is an absolute expert in this system because he had wins with both colors. He beat Jan Carlsen in uh, Tata Steel, I think, 2008 or 9, with black pieces, and here he beats Kasparov with white. So he really knew this position well all his career. So Bishop of 3, I'm preventing the move B6 here. Bishop D7. Now, when you play play Bishop D7, this is square belongs to this knight. Because when I go g4, g5, you want to put the knight on d7. So now I play knight b3. Because if I move g4 now, g4 doesn't make any sense. Because he can take, take, and play bishop c6. And if I go g5, my knight can go to b7. Then he can play e5. So because of that, he plays first knight b3. It's a well-known theory. Uh, knight a5. And then here, uh, Anand went for the move knight a5, which is a positional approach. There's the move e5. Um, to understand this pawn sacrifice, one of the one of the games I strongly suggest you to, to look at is the game. Um, I write it in the general chat for everyone so that you can uh, you can look at it with yourself. Uh, Boyevich. 
He's talking about Zoom chat, but I'll, yeah, I'll type it, it in as well. Cool, of course. So, um, it's not exactly this, this, this position, but this is the setup. This shows the idea of how E5 works. It's a long-term pawn sacrifice. Um, it's, it's equal, but they, they both need to know a lot of sharp, sharp moves here. Um, so knight a5, knight takes a5, queen takes a5, queen to d3, rook d8, and uh, here we play rook fd1, it's a pretty good move, and bishop to c6. Surprisingly, Kaspar played this move, which leaves him uh, sort of unprotected here, his pieces, uh, against a very obvious threat, which is what? Who can tell me? It's a very simple cheapo. Yes, b4. Because I cannot take, right? I take runs into rook b1, and then after this, I have this, right? So queen c7, no, b5 is rushed, actually. b5, uh, he takes bishop b7, and it was played before this game, hmm. but here Alan managed to improve. Uh, uh, b5? No, no, so, sorry. b5, no, no, here he plays this, the go bishop d7. Here he has an improvement. Take on a6 was played before, or knight e2. Those are two moves that have been played before this game in, in the existing theory back at the time, and here simply Alan had improved with rook a b1. Here he says. So, um, a b5 and knight b5. Engine likes both moves equally. He gives a little bit more to a takes b5, but who can resist having two bishops against against Kaspar? So knight b5, bishop b5, rook b5, uh, queen b5, okay. I think rook b5 is also a move. We did move c4, a5. So queen b5, rook a8, c4, e5. Bishop b6, queen c8, this and this. It's showtime. <laughs> it goes, I think, a5, oh, not yet. and bishop <laughs> 8 It goes h3, and here it's probably queen e6. We can say, oh, somebody had seen this uh, before, but there's more than that, actually. Uh, a lot of people have seen this position with rook d5. And rook d5 is a playable move, but if I don't touch the touch the rook after rook d5, which you played in the game, if I just go h5, and then I go g5, g4, it's actually very complex. It's still advantages for white, but very complex. Here is very interesting. Um, there is a simple idea for, for, for white that wins without sacrificing. It's a very simple idea. It's a regrouping idea. You just have to tell them where the pieces are going. And black absolutely cannot do anything against white's plan. Looking for a plan to regroup. Hmm. Mm -mm. I see people are really rushing to find the find the solution here. It, the thing is that it's very obvious that this is my worst piece, right? So whatever you do has to do with if I could, if that bishop gets gets to the game. Um, okay, somebody says rook b two, bishop b one, or rook b two, rook b two. But then if I go rook b two, rook b two, bishop. E1, E4 is hanging, so you have to kind of consider everything at the same time. Oh, Rook E1, Bishop Eventually, D1. yeah, but yeah. you first have to plan. So the best plan is this. Rook E1, Bishop The D1. best thing to do in this position is to play Rook uh, C5. Rook C, Rook C1, defending that. H5. And I go Queen A4, very strong. And now I want to do this. Now this is defending the pawn. I want to do this. Yeah, okay, Queen A4 is crazy. That's like... <laughs> It's like so, interstellar. I play rook d5, but Kasparov surprisingly took. Takes back, there, c5, e4, bishop e2, rook e5. I, I told you six things. I think I have to add a seventh one, which is intuition. Here, Anand played one of the top three moves of the engines, and although it gives plus four, it's one of those plus fours that you make one mistake, it's going to go to zero. You make the second mistake, it goes to minus four. So it's a very uh, slippery uh, uh, road that he's walking uh, here, Anand. 
So, for example, d6, he just has bishop takes d6. So he played this very good move, queen d7. Now I'm going to ask everyone, in the game he played... Uh, is rook g5 the main line? Or? Yeah, he played rook g5. But what if I play e3? Rook f1 and now rook g5. Why to play? This is a very beautiful tactic. Hmm. We want to take if someone seven, writes right? a book so bishop d3. All the tactics from Anand, this is going to be on top of it. Bishop d3, queen h5. Well, bishop d3, I can go uh, e2. Oh, well, bishop d3, e2. I can take rook takes g2. Somebody says about bishop d3, I can go e2. Okay. So no bishop d3. Okay. Okay, nice, Daniel. Yes. Daniel found it. H4. Because rook takes g2, I simply have h5. Because of 7 is... is Bad. So if I go back rook to e5, b6 first, and then I go h5, then I win the pawn and I win the game. Because h4, h4 is very important. f7 again. Um, so he played queen e7, it's a very good move. Attacking f7 is a very important move. Uh, rook g5, rook g1, d3, d6, rook, take, rook g3, queen takes b7. Queen is enough, of course, so is a threat, so you go king h2, and that's game over. And uh, this was his, uh, his win, first win against Kasparov since uh, in the classical, since the first game I showed you. But okay, the follow up didn't go uh, accordingly for, for Anand, who lost three games in a row next next week. After that, it was the end of the week, so they had one day off, so they're not losing three games in the, in the week following. Okay, another person who Anand played uh, exchange swords with, and uh, he was uh, a legend, and he played a world championship match against him, although not a very fair match, was was Carl. Oh, okay. Oh, why are you jumping? Yeah. Um, I chose this position from one of. Uh, one of Anand's game against Karpov. Uh, uh, I mean, obviously, Karpov from 96 after he won his match against uh, Kalski, he didn't have very great results and soon was showing that the age is showing it's taking its toll and uh, he wasn't getting the results he used to get. Nevertheless, still, Karpov 2775. Um, this is uh, why to play. Queen B1 equals Bishop A6. Rook c1, then I go queen to e7. We need to really calculate. Somebody said queen b1. Again, intuition here by Anna is, is fantastic. Some, some people say maybe it's worth it, maybe it doesn't worth it. Sometimes oh, intuition game. should go with the with concrete calculation. And here, at, at his best, or maybe just at the beginning of being one of uh, his best and being world champion, Anna had it both. So, Kosti, what do you think? This is a kind of decision we kind of have to make, make it with, with close eyes. Oh, I know this one. I know this one, okay. Yeah, it's no fun. <laughs> it's what, what, it's, what's not fun? The answer or? Oh, I mean, yeah, spoiling it. Ah, okay. But you know, the, the move on play is actually uh, I'd say in terms of being the most accurate engine stuff shows something better. But uh, doesn't matter. Huh. What Anna is what a strong player would play and uh, it's efficient enough. Yeah. Uh, people are saying Queen B1, I just said, but what kind of a gift we, we love in chess, guys? The kind of gift we, we always deal with from the day one when we play chess.
we all we, we, we like this kind of gift a lot. That's the first gift we get in chess. Uh, somebody got it. Yes, the great gift. <laughs> it could be three. Now I have a threat now. I want to take and go queen d1. Check and then take on b7. So after going to bishop e6, we take on h7. Takes the, so great gift a lot of time works with the knight going to g5 and delivering checkmate, right? But this time the rook turns. So this and b3. Okay. And now e6 is a threat, so he has to move the queen to control e6. And this is just bishop and six is coming, so this is not gonna work. Yeah. And king d8, and then Anand's uh, maybe it was in time pressure or something, I don't know, but anyways, he just converted the east from this there, and then this, this is coming as well. Nice. Yeah, he. Ne uh, Anand lost the match in 91, yeah, in quarterfinal, also he lost the match in 1997 in Lausanne, I would say, or Zurich, I don't, I'm not sure, I think it was in La Lausanne, uh, in Switzerland, in the final of the World Championship. But it was very controversial because it already had played for a month to get to the final, and then Kasparov just, Kasparov just showed up to the final and played the final match against him. So it was a little bit, uh, the, the way that Peter had it was questionable, but anyways, he, he played a match and he lost it. Um, well, he has an overall, I think, positive score against the carpool. And now, here comes the moment I was waiting for it myself. Uh, the match in 2008. Now, this is an important one. So, the 2008 match between Kramnik and Anand. Who is the world champion? Who is the who is the challenger? Who knows that? This is the... and Anand. Now, everybody makes this mistake. Anand is the world champion. Everybody misses the tournament that was a candidate slash world championship. He won a round robin, eight players in 2007. And he went to Kramnik. the one to beat Kasparov. In Mexico. Anand won that tournament. And he was declared world champion, but Kramnik was given the uh, the odds that if if he uh, well I wouldn't call it odds the privilege that if he doesn't defend his title, then he can play the 2008 match. So Kramnik is a challenger, but uh, the entire time he was saying that he doesn't consider himself not the world champion because Anand didn't win the match. But uh, well, here Anand won it in the match and. With the power he has shown in the slot defense. If you want to learn slot defense in this modern way, Anand is your pivot person. He has a lot of classics. In it. And this game, these two games he won the World Championship are, are the must to see. And the depth of the, 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 depth of the, uh, the theory is so good that, and so well prepared that uh, to this day you cannot really add much to it. And it's like 13 years ago. There was a story on. Uh, there was a story on Moon Chess, and I see, by Jonathan Rosson, and he said how he volunteered to work with Anand's team, and how he were just all sitting in front of the computer, analyzing with the engine back and forth for hours, including Anand himself, for hours every day. And uh, they were using cloud computing at the time. So now, how, how many of you know that how to use cloud computing to analyze your games? I mean, you can use, for example, Chess-based cloud, that's one possibility. It's a very strong engine. You can you can hire strong engines there. But Rawson didn't know about it. He didn't know you know what a core mean. Who, know, who knows what 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 what, what he meant by referring to a core, computer course, right? He had just a regular computer at the time, and then they made sure that he will have a good one and he has access to it remotely to prepare. So. Uh, that is Anand in 2000, and that's pretty much how we prepare these days. So, the art of preparation, Anand changed it after this match forever. Um, workout and sport and you know, physical fitness all came at last after they have done all the opening preparations. So, let's see what does this game have for us. 
Seven. Seven. Five. It should be three. Juicy. Juicy four, and it was for now. E4, and we have a C5 system. It's kind of forced. E5, CD4, also, kind of control this has come prepared to this game. Knight B5, AB5, E takes F6, E takes F6, and Castle. So, Queen B6, and uh, Queen 2. Nowadays, um, I don't know the theory much, but I know B4 is the main line. Or is it main line here or I think earlier? But B4 I think is the main line. But here, he, yeah, he, they jump again. Yeah, jump again. This is the first one. They play the same opening ball. I don't know why I keep next and just jump one. So, I skip one. Queen b6, queen e2, and here he played uh, my, my bishop e7, which is a very playable risky line. It's very risky, this one. This one, bishop e7, is very risky. And it shows a lot of eagerness and depth of preparation that he's taking such a risky line to play. Uh, I don't know this theory much, not an expert in it, but before, and bishop c5 is apparently the main line. She ended up playing both in correspondence and over the watches with hmm. enough successful black in that black maintains a close to 50% scoring here, which is a good thing, not in the opening, I guess. So, um, another place we should be seven, we should be five, we should be six, uh, or key one, and look here, g3. And we are following Anand's notes, which from 2008 are as good as the things I added to this analysis. Because when I was checking the game, of course, the engine, I saw a lot of correspondence games, and uh, they were all engine again analysis. Uh, and this is it's a very fascinating position. There's so many tactics involved. Uh, so I pretty much saw that whatever Anand understood back in 2008, uh, of course, it's a world championship match, but he needs to know that well. But still, is what the engine see today with a very little improvement. So that's quite a good work on, on his own, on, on his part and his, his team. Rook g4, bishop f4, bishop f4, knight xd4. So this is a very complex one, but what do you play here as, as black? I, I've lectured two, for too long, but what do you play here as black? He said, show this position to me. I don't know about, uh, I don't know about Greg and, uh, and, uh, Kostya, but I would freak out if I were black here. <laughs> my king is weak, he's stuck in the center, he sacrificed the piece, he's coming after my knight and the seven, I will freak out. Seriously. Well, what more? Kostya, what do you think? Unless you know this one as well, too. I'm probably sure you know. Uh, this one I don't know. But yeah, I'd be freaking out too. Yeah. Especially if you're playing the World Championship match, huh? Mm-hmm. So. Alright. Here, you can use simply one process to make him move. Rook move, he plays knight takes e6 and take on d7. It's really bad. So I better keep my rook there and then run away with my king. So I play h5. Of G6 was moved to 96, E6, of G7, King F8, oh. Queen D3. Now he wants to go King to Queen to H7. Now next one is forced. What do we play, guys? Yeah, Rook G7. Mm -hmm. King H6. Ah, Rook D8 first. That's that's important. He has to win the tempo. Queen E2. Uh, Queen G3 check is just that I go King F7, I have to press the bishop is hanging. Right, guys? Oh. If Queen goes to here, just King F7, right? Because Rook G8 and, and, uh, and the bishop is hanging, so both cases could press the Queen E2, King H6, now Rook G8 will be, will be played. King F1, Rook G8, A4, check. 
it should be three. Uh, okay, three. Okay, that's finally all of these moves are best engine moves by both players. One of the best. I mean, yeah, two, three, two, because but they played and everything that the engine keeps saying zero, 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 zero point zero zero. Keep going, same thing. This is the first and last mistake in this game. And I don't know if unpunished, so black to play. Hmm. We are root you one check. King d2, queen d4, king c2, bishop f5, king b4. looks interesting. Do you see that uh, the rook on h3 is standing? The bishop on h3 is standing? Queen d4 definitely very possible too. What about the bishop? I don't have an endgame to draw. You take on b2 and I can make it draw, right? I can put my rook back to g3. I know you want to play with g1 check, but also after queen d4, I can have to choose first go with g3 and then take on h3. Queen e5, I can do this, I think, go c3 probably, just king b1, c2. I think we can start with g1. Yeah. King hunt. Play the most aggressive like this, most aggressive move, and here he made it here, this was money. He missed bishop f5? And he missed rook g4. Because bishop b3 just went rook g3. Alright, uh, bishop b4 is also awesome. more, I didn't see, I, I didn't remember that. Bishop b4. Rook g2, I saw that this is money. So, but he made a small mistake, bishop there, it gives a chance. So, if the his opponent here because he was going time kind of made a mistake but after the took to d3 all the damage is gone most of it because the king finds safety on a2 and now he has two pass pawns black king is weak two oh. chances to hold but luckily for Anand not to be successful in luck to he played f3 and then Anand got what he wanted to check we should be three and we should we should lose three which is still I think winning church today but we should be three wins quite uh wins instantly because there's no rook c3, so bishop is 3 a5, rook g2, a6, and then okay, this one. Nice one, huh? Now, nowadays, you play such deep prep. Next game, do you repeat it or not? You repeat that, Postia? <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, well, it's, if, it's you're Anand, you do. <laughs> if you're Anand, you didn't repeat it. Uh, I try to go as fast as I can. So again, we have the same opening, this little different move order. Oh, wait a second, I jumped. <coughs> this is the one. And this time it will new new move, g8. Bishop of four, bishop of six. Bishop b3, f5. He's trying to play move f4. Rook fc1. Uh, these moves are all playable. Uh, these are my correspondence analysis, uh, which we probably don't want to go through them. <laughs> it's because it's just move, moves that I have. So you play this move, then you play this move, and you know, engine says this move. You don't want that. You want to learn the idea. So rook c1, f4, bishop h4. Bishop e7, very strong move. He's playing against g2 right away. That's the key idea in this opening. a4. Bishop takes h4. Okay, queen is also a move. Bishop h4 takes king e7. Now, what's my threat here? I want to go knight f6 probably, right? So, rook a3. Makes sense also to maybe place some rook h3 and knight f3 back or just place some g3 and f3 if necessary. I'm not worried about the diagonal that much as much as I'm worried about the pressure on the file at this point. C8 takes, who takes, now back back is a problem. Who goes back? Queen C5. Queen G4. Still, I think they're following some correspondence games here. Queen E5. Knight F3. And now he plays Queen F6. Rook E1. Black to play. 
Maybe I just have to show it. What do you think, Ostia? Yeah, we have a few minutes. We, we, there's no um, there's no rush. Okay. We have some H5. Queen H8. Wow, that's so... Yeah. Queen H8, I take on F4. I mean, that's too, that's too creative. We said oh, no, it's creative. I, I, I admit, but that's, that's too creative. I would think that Rook C2 can be an option. In fact, I forgot. I think Rook C2 is the move. Yeah. Ah, Rook C5 is. He's flying the move H5. Somebody said it. Before, and now Rook C3. He's putting pressure on the knight on F3. And here, it's a very complex position. It's a very complex position. And again, in this complex position, in time pressure, Kamek uh, made a mistake and played the move knight takes d4. Now, everybody might have seen this one. Right? What's happening here? Everybody might have seen this tactic. It's everywhere, chess tempo, chess.com, leeches everywhere. Queen e5, I can just take it. There's no back, back, back rank for me. You should work back to f1. I know when the game ends. I don't remember this part. <laughs> Uh, Daniel, that one, I just put queen takes f3. He says Daniel says queen d4, rook d1, bishop f3, then I take queen f3. Yep, we have an answer. Okay, queen takes d4, rook d1, knight f6. The important thing is that there's, he, didn't, he missed this knight e3, I wish everybody had seen it. After this, there's this check and then knight e3. And here he resigned. So yeah, he he missed it, but he had to go. He he had to go here. Queen yeah, is killer. Position. I mean, I, I still don't want to play this position as as white because king comes to d6, knight e5, g5, f5, um, and then he, whenever he plays a5, rook to a3. So what? What I did in all these games I chose, and I tried to focus on the the ones that I didn't have time to cover them. He always has these equal positions that they are equal, but he he tries to outplay his opponent in a, in a dynamic decisions, and it's a little bit different from how. Yeah, um, ninety three is tough. And if his his opponents would not choose to enter a dynamic position, he would just uh, get some slight advantage, like the game against Karpo. And the analysis he had himself, he said, "Okay, I knew that Karpo would choose this line because." Uh, he always goes for the, he always goes for the safest. So he always challenges his, his opponent on that for the most part. Earlier in his career, until he uh, maybe lost the title to Magnus, that he always tries to uh, place a principal line in depth analysis, dragging his opponent into some uh, unknown areas which his opponent may not know about, and then. Uh, they either concede and play safe to give a positional advantage, or uh, or um, they may collapse like this. In this case, uh, Kramnik just simply blundered the knight takes d4. Both games, Kramnik played good 27, 28 moves. He was behind on time, like say, half an hour to 40 minutes, and then this is how it happened. Someone says it sounds like Carlson, but just Carlson was boring. Well, things have changed, and everybody has his own style, so. Carlson is a more of a positional technical player, so it's different from the way Anand plays. But again, uh, Anand played an important role in, in our book, in my book, with Sabina and uh, and uh, in my learning interest because he has he has always these complex ideas in his games, which is which is interesting. Questions? Nobody asked me how he prepares. Hello, any questions about? Well, I think uh, as far as I knew, I talked with some of the people in his team. They kind of break down the jobs in certain lines and you do this, I do that. And then 
what happens is that he actively monitors the, the seconds and what the, the work they do and he refines and get back and go back and forth with them so he's very active he, he enjoys analyzing himself so and his his energy and drive kind of makes the team doing a good job i think at least since the 2018 one this match, 2010 and 2012, he won three matches. So, how should we prepare new opponents nowadays? I would do a lot of uh, engine analysis, look at the modern games. I wouldn't go very, very old in the to learn the old ideas. And uh, a lot of correspondence games, I'll take ideas from there. And you have to memorize, unfortunately, guys. You want good openings, you want to be professionally strong, you have to memorize a lot of things. Doesn't work without memorizing. I'm, I know I, I know Greg is about to hit me in the head because memorizing seriously, but uh, that's what it takes, I guess. Other questions, Kostya? Um, no, I think we are all set. Thank you so much, Alshan. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. I think I just talked a lot, but I. I just like to, I, I like to talk about Anand, so I think I told too much stories, <laughs> too many stories. Yeah, Anand is amazing. Anand uh, is fantastic. Yeah. So yeah. Did we get asked to play against him? I know who played against him. Mark Esserman played against him, right? Who is it? Mark Esserman played against him. Against Anand. Yeah, well, yeah. Mark was pushing. Yeah, he was slightly better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a, it's a good experience. I mean, like, I would. I would think a lot of players like me would, would, would pay to play a game like that, like that in the summer. Mm -hmm. Right. It, it, it's, it's, I think he's the, he's the best player to, to learn from for players who are 2200 to 2400. Hmm. And, and do Why do you, um, as I said, versatility and uh, opening prep. And uh, he has a lot of uh, technical games. Which I said he was very effortless in showing defensive skills. So I use Anand's game he when he equalizes from slightly worse positions. How he uses that to, to equal, how he uses his knight in, in worse positions and to equalize. And he has this kind of feeling for how to achieve equality uh, in dynamic situations. So I use Anand's games more than any other world champion at this point to teach my students. Cool. What's your favorite game from Anand? Uh, we didn't get to show it this this game. Have you seen from this one? Which one? Arun, Arun, uh, against oh, Arun. oh, the famous one. Okay. Yeah, this one. This one. Yes, everybody knows that one against Arun. I I was planning to show it, but I wanted to show these ones because older ones and many people may not have looked at it. Mm -hmm. But this game, um, Anand is really really cool against Arun. Yeah, he has that. He has this amazing win against the. Uh, I think this one against. You know, you know this one, right? Against Fabiano? After yeah, I remember this. Yeah. Oh, you tweeted this one, actually. <laughs> yeah. So this one also very famous. I'm just going to show it very quickly. And then Queen D4. <laughs> this is also a very nice one. Anna has so many amazing games. Also against Ivanchuk, that one when he plays GTX F6. That's also a very beautiful game. And he has a lot of games we don't look at them, not against very famous players, like against Erwin Lamy or some, some, some other games in the Bundesliga. He has very interesting positions. Cool. Well, thanks so much. This was sure. awesome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I hope you guys had fun. Oh, thank and, you. Uh, somebody is mentioning it means against cardiac and that's too mm -hmm. well thanks for having me have a good evening everyone thanks everyone for being here